Hi and welcome to Swedish Plant Guys. In this video we will give you all you need to know about the Bocornia recurvata, also known as the ponytail palm. And this is a very easy to care for plant, but there are things you need to know. And as usual we will divide this video up into four parts. You have the purchase, the planting, the placement and the care of the plant. So if you want to skip forward you can, but we always recommend you to watch the entire video to get all you need to know. Everything in this video is based on our 20 years experience of taking care of indoor tropical plants. If you like this video please give it a thumbs up, that really helps this channel a lot. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, please do and hit the bell as well so you get a notification every time we put up something new. And also like us on Facebook and Instagram where you can get sneak previews on upcoming videos and sometimes a little bit more. So starting off with the purchase. Now this is the ponytail palm or also known as the bottle palm. The Latin name is Bocornia recurvata. Um, and this is not a palm. We have to start with that. This is actually more of a succulent than a palm. But in Sweden, we, in Swedish, we call it flask lilia, um, which means uh, bottle lily. And it's not a lily either, it's a succulent. So I don't know why they name them like that. But either way, uh, another name that is common both in Swedish and in English is elephant's foot. And that is, of course, because it has this nice, thick base of a trunk here, which actually looks like an elephant's foot. Now, the ponytail palm is quite an expensive plant. And the reason for that is that it grows very, very slowly. Which, uh, and it has this massive base or massive trunk on it. So, if we have, for instance, this really, really nice specimen here, which has this extremely thick trunk. You can understand that it has taken quite a long time, especially since it grows very slowly, to get this massive trunk here. So it has been standing, growing in the ground in Central or South America for quite some time. Then it has been cut off by the stems here, and then it's been shipped. In our case, it's been shipped to Amsterdam in Holland, where it's sent to the growers. And they take only the stems and the, the, this massive trunk, they put it in soil and they start to grow out the foliage in the greenhouse, which also takes a long time because it grows so slowly. This is the reason why it is an expensive plant. It's because it takes a lot of time to look like this. So when you go out and buy this, you need to know that you have to spend quite a lot of money on it. And it's also depending on which size, of course, you want to buy. So when you go out, you need to know exactly how large you want your bottle uh, your uh, bottle palm to be and how much money you want to spend. And also by saying that you need to choose how big the trunk and the size of the stems are uh, because they will not grow anymore. I'll show you here on this one next to me because it has been cut off. Uh, actually, it's been cut off when it's grown in, uh, in the soil, in, in the ground, it's been cut off down here and it's sent out new stems. We have one, two, three, four, five different stems coming out of the base of the trunk here. Then they've cut it off again when it's been sent to the greenhouses all around the world. And this will never be taller than it is right now. So it will look like this. Now the foliage of course here, the new shoots of the, all of the stems will continue to grow. But it will give it a completely different look after a while. So you need to choose when you buy this plant how large and how big you want the trunk and the thickest stems to be. 
also depending on where you want to place it in your home. If you want to have it on a windowsill, you need to buy a, that, a specimen that is the right size for your window. Now also make sure to look at the different stems. Now this one only has one trunk and then it has a lot of shoots coming out of it. If you are choosing between, let's say, 10 different plants at the shop, make sure to choose the plant that has the most amount of shoots coming out from the trunk or the base or the stem here. So just count them and pick the one that has the most amount because that will give you the highest chance of getting a dense and nice crown on your balconia. Now quite often in our all you need to know videos we say that you need to knock off the pot in the shop to look at the roots. We do not recommend you doing that with the balconia and the reason for that is it could actually crumble when you do that. What you do instead is that you grab a hold of the pot in the shop and then you feel the stem like this and you move, try and move the trunk sideways like this to see if it is detached to all of the soil inside of the pot. This is actually very, very firm. Nothing happens when I try and move the trunk. But this one I have here on the table, if I hold the pot and I try and move this thick stem here, you can see that I can actually move it quite easily. Now, there can be a lot of different reasons for this. One reason, reason could be that it doesn't have the right amount of roots down in the soil here. And that is one reason you should not pick this plant if, it's, if that's the reason. Another reason could be that just before they send it out to the shop, they actually repotted it. So when I move this, it could be that it has a very sm a smaller root system in this larger pot here. Uh, and it's quite hard to know why it's moving in the pot. So when choosing your plant in the shop, if you come over a plant that actually this, the trunk is moving like this, when you touch it, choose another one. It should be firmly placed in the pot. Shouldn't move when you wiggle it a little bit. So the next, next thing you need to look at are the leaves. Um, there are two types of leaves on the Balcarnia recurvata. There is one variety that has a little bit of a thicker, thicker leaves on them. All of the ones I have here have these very, very thin leaves but there are a variety that has a lot, almost twice as thick as these leaves are. So you also need to determine which variety you want. They are all named Balcone Recovata. They usually doesn't have another name, but you should know that there are two types uh, and it is concerning the thickness of the leaves here or the, the width of the leaves. Look at the leaves and make sure that they don't have any black spots on them, don't have any burnt edges on them, um, and look closely on both sides of the leaves so that you don't have any pests on them. At least no pests that you can look and see with your eyes. And what you're looking for then are either small spots that are uh, a little bit bulgy when you touch on them could be scale you could also have mealy bugs which are, are you can see with your eyes as well they are white and fuzzy uh, or fluffy and also but you will probably almost always have a little bit of a black or, or a brown tip like this one not black but brown and because when you have your balconia indoors and not in a greenhouse this will almost always happen so if it has small 
brown tips on them. It's not a problem. And even if it doesn't, you will probably get it in your home. So you can choose that plant and not worry about that. Be a little bit careful when managing the leaves of your Balkania because the leaves are quite sharp. You can't see it with your own eyes, but the edges of the leaves are actually, um, they, they're a little bit uh, serrated. They have small, small, small teeth on them. So if you go in like I did for this video, I was going in and picking off a uh, brown uh, leaf here. I actually missed the, leaf, the brown leaf and got a, uh, a green one instead. And when I pulled, I got a, it almost looks like a paper cut, but it bleeds and it will hurt for the rest of the day because these small, small, small teeth really really hurt so be careful when you are handling the leaves the Bocania recovata is a flowering plant but i have only seen it flower a couple of times in my life and uh, usually it will flower if you are growing this outside in the ground if you have the temperature um, and the possibility to grow this outside it can flower but it usually only flowers after it's about 10 years old or older. When it flowers, it sends up a cluster of small, 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 white, creamy flowers, uh, which could also be a little bit reddish in color as well. It's very, very nice flower. It looks great. However, if you're growing this indoors, inside your house, you will probably never get it flowering because it doesn't have all of the things it needs indoors to flower. So we buy this plant purely for the nice thick trunks and stems and for the nice foliage on this plant and not for the flowers. So now you have picked out which of these lovely Bocanias you want in the shop and it's time to take it home. Now, this is a plant that actually can withstand quite low temperatures. It can withstand temperatures down to about five degrees Celsius, which is approximately 41 degrees Fahrenheit. So it can withstand quite cold temperatures. It can withstand freezing temperatures if it's just during a very short period of time. So usually you do not need to cover this when you take it home from the shop. But if you know that it is extremely cold outside, then I recommend you to make sure that the shop wraps it in plastic or paper or something just to cover it a little bit so that it doesn't damage during transport. Otherwise, you can just grab it like this and take it home. So moving on to planting. When you get this plant to your house, we recommend you to wait wait for repotting this and you should wait for quite a some time before repotting it wait at least one year before repotting your balconia the reason for this is that you do not want to disturb it when it gets to your home it could be that it has been sent from the um, uh, greenhouse quite recently and it comes from high humidity, a lot of light. It gets the perfect environment. Then it has landed in the shop and then it's gotten to your house. And it will not get all of those perfect surroundings that it might be custom to. So when it gets to your house, make sure to wait for a repot. You do not have to worry about that either. This is a plant that actually can withstand and almost likes to be a little bit root bound. So even if the pot is a little bit um, bulgy and you can see that it is a little bit of root bound, it's not an issue. So wait to repot this at least one year when it gets to your house. If this plant gets to be a little bit root bound, as I said, it doesn't hurt the plant, but what happens is that it actually slows down the growing process even more. This is extremely slow growing. 
but if it get roots bound, it actually grows even slower. Uh, so if you want it to grow as fast as it can, you should repot it, but only repot it every two or three years. One year from when you got it to your host, that house, then every two or three years. And when you repot this, only repot it in a slightly larger pot. Never repot it in a large container or a large pot. Because what happens then is that the soil around the roots are going to retain water for a very long time. And that can hurt the roots. You could get root rot or other bacterial or fungus problems. So when you repot, only repot in a slightly larger container. Now, very often when you buy this plant, you get it in a very shallow container. It almost looks like a bonsai container. And the, the reason is the same here. You never want this plant to be standing in water or in soil that holds water for a very long time. So in a shallow container like this, when you water, a lot of the, that water will just go straight through and go out of the drainage holes in the bottom and never injuring the roots. It doesn't mean that you have to have this plant in a shallow container. You can actually use any type of pot you want. But know that if you use a larger or a deeper container like this one, make sure you have good drainage. Now just to be absolutely clear, this is a plant you always want to have drainage holes in the bottom. Never ever put this in a closed container of any type because if it stands in water you will get problems and we'll get to those problems later on in the care of the plant. But always use drainage holes in the bottom of the pot. Now when you eventually repot this, what type of a soil should you use? Well, it is not a picky plant concerning the soil. You can use any type of normal standard planting soil. But what we recommend you to do is to mix that up with something that gives you better drainage. Now we have a video on how to get good drainage, so we put that up there. But the main thing here is that you do not want the soil to retain water for a long period of time. You want it to retain a little bit of water and lose all the excess water from the bottom of the pot. Now, one way of getting that is actually to mix up normal standard planting soil with either perlite or pumice. And the mixture that is quite good for this plant is about 70% of normal standard planting soil and 30% of either pumice or perlite. That mixture will give you good drainage and it will also help these roots to become nice, full and thick. It also works to plant this in what we call pure pumice, which is actually almost entirely pumice with a little bit of a mixture of, let's say, clay, for instance. Uh, we have a all you need to know about pumice video you can go and watch as well, so you get how pumice actually works. But it works perfectly with pumice as well. It also works perfectly in a self-watering system. Now the reason for that is that if you have a self-watering system you have a water reservoir in the bottom below the where you've planted your, your, uh, your plant. Uh, which means that when you water this the excess water goes down into the water reservoir and is never there are never too much water with the roots in the soil. However, you also need to have really good drainage in that self-watering system as well, because you have that water reservoir that is slowly pushing some water up to the roots. So if that soil can retain too much water, you'll get problems. But if you have good drainage and all the excess water goes down, just a little bit comes up again, it works perfectly in a self-watering system. Make sure that you let that 
uh, water reservoir dry out completely in between when you fill that up again and you know that it will dry out a little bit and then it gets water again. Now regarding letting this plant dry out, just let it dry out as soon as you see that there is no water in the water reservoir if you have a self-watering system then you can start to refill that but make sure that it is completely empty before you fill it up again. So don't wait too long just when it gets empty fill it up again. Moving on to placement. Where should you place your Balkania recovata in your house? That is one of the easiest things about this plant. You could place it almost anywhere in your house. And I basically mean almost anywhere. You can place this, if you have it on a windowsill, you can have it in the north, the west, the south or the east. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and you could also place it a little bit into the room as well, in a darker placement. However, if you want to have your Balkania in a darker spot, a little bit into the room, we recommend you that when you get this to your house, start by placing it a little bit brighter. Let it be, uh, let it get used to your environment in your house and then you gradually move it in to a darker placement. Because if you put it in a darker placement directly when you get it home, it could get a shock and you could get problems with it. But if you just move it gradually to where you want it, it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, on the other hand, this is one of the few indoor tropical plants that can withstand direct sunlight. We use this plant quite often when we know that it is a placement that has a lot of direct sunlight almost all day. Because this plant thrives when it gets all of that bright light. So you can basically place this anywhere in your house. Just be a little bit careful when you've just gotten it, gotten it home to you. Now with that said, of course, the more light you give this plant, the quicker it will grow. It will never grow quickly, but it will grow quicker if you give it a lot of light. If you place it somewhere where it's darker, it will actually almost look like it stops growing entirely. It's, it grows, but it will be very, very, very slowly. So if you want it to grow, if you want it to get bigger, place it somewhere where it gets a lot of light and it could get direct sunlight as well. Also know that if you place it in direct sunlight or with a lot of indirect light, it will be a little bit lighter in color. And when you place it in a darker spot, the shade of green will become more deep, a lot darker than these ones we have here. So that is also just a decorating tip for you. Know that if you place it darker, the green in this plant will become darker as well. So let's talk about humidity. Uh, this is not a plant that needs a specific humidity in your house. It will like it if you have higher humidity, uh, but it will not get hurt by low humidity. Our experience though is that when you go below 30% humidity, which is quite extreme, then it starts to injure this a little bit. And what happens is, I said before that you will always get a little bit of a brown tip on this plant. One of the reasons is when you get lower humidity, this is one of the things that can happen. You get these brown, very dry tips. The reason for this is that it cannot push all of the water all the way out to the tip the water actually evaporates before it gets out to the tip and the tip dies back. The cells in the tip dies back. If you have really, really low humidity, those tips will start, those brown tips will actually start to become larger. They will move up the leaf. Um, and it could get to the point where it actually looks quite bad. Now, you can always use a sharp scissor 
to cut off those brown parts of the tips. But if that moves too far up along the leaf, it could actually look bad. So by having a humidity that is over 30%, you eliminate that risk quite a lot. And one way of eliminating that risk could be you could go out and buy an expensive humidifier that raises your humidity in the whole entire room. Or you can just, like we do here in Sweden, you can just, un during winter when you have low humidity, you can place some saucers around, around the plant with a little bit of water on them. That water will evaporate and will help to raise the humidity around the plant. Another way can also be by bundling your plants together when it's really, really low humidity. They're actually helping each other to raise the humidity. Uh, now, something that comes from this is, of course, never put this over a very warm, very dry radiator. Because the same thing can happen. If you push, push, put this over a warm radiator, you can have that these brown tips start to move up the leaf and become larger. So if you know that you have it on a windowsill and you know that you will get low humidity, then perhaps move it a little bit during winter time or when you have low humidity and then move it back when it gets higher again. Moving on to the care of the plant. First of all, water. How much water should this plant have? Well, it actually doesn't drink a lot of water and it doesn't want you to give it a lot of water. Our recommendation concerning this plant is that it should always dry out almost completely in between watering. And the easiest way to do that is just to feel the soil for moisture. Now we have a video that gives you four different tips on how you can see if your plant is wet or dry. So you can go and check that out on how to do that. But let the plant dry out quite a lot in between watering. Another reason for this is, of course, that, like I said in the beginning, this is a succulent, which means that it actually stores water. Now, it stores the water partially in some of the root system, but partially, mainly in the, this big, nice trunk. It stores water here, which means that even if it dries out and stays dry for quite some time, it has water that it can distribute to the leaves. Uh, and that is also an indication that this does not need and want a lot of water. Now, how do you know if you've let it dry out too long? Well, the first thing that will happen if it dries out for a too long period of time is that you will see that the oldest leaves on this plant, which means the, the ones that came out first from the trunk or the stems here, these ones here will actually start to become brown, dry brown. Uh, so brown that you can just pull them straight off. That is an indication that you've waited a little bit too long. However, this is also a plant that has a stem, which means that it will continue to create stems. And one of the ways it creates that long stem is, of course, by dropping and shedding leaves. So it will have a crown, but it will drop the older leaves over a long period of time to create that stem. But if you let it dry out too much, you will see that these will start to become brown and you can just pull them off. If you see that, then perhaps you can give it not more water, but water it a little bit more frequently. Another way of see seeing that is that it can start to wilter a little bit. You can see that the leaves are starting to hang a little bit. And usually it's, like I said, it's the oldest ones, the very oldest that die off, but the older leaves as well, they start to hang, whereas the newest leaves are still standing. It's almost like the plant is sending the water it has stored out to the new shoots because that's the future. 
and it's not pushing out water to the older leaves. So you see that the older are starting, the older are starting to wilter, but the newest are still standing. That is also an indication that you need to step up the frequency of your watering. Now, on the other hand, if you give this too much water, or if it's standing in a soil that is moist for a too long period of time, what will happen is you will get yellow leaves on your plant. Some of the leaves, or usually the oldest ones here, will start to turn yellow. And then you can see that all the newest leaves as well will also start to change color. After they have been yellow, they will start to become brown. And another thing that also can happen if you give it too much water is that the tips of the leaves can get brown, but not brown like we talked about before. We've talked about this type of brown where it's just crunchy brown, it's dried out brown. If the tips of the leaves start to become brown or darker brown and a little bit wet or soft or mushy to the touch, then you know that you've given it too much water. Stop watering it, let it dry out completely and let it dry out for a long period of time before giving it water again. Another thing that can happen is that if it's standing in water, which it should never do, the roots can get injured. You could get root rot. Now, the signs of root rot is that you get black spots on the leaves or on the tips of the leaves. This is a very, very dark, dark brown, blackish. You can usually see when it is root rot. Um, and if you let that go too far, if you do not let it dry out, you try and kill that fungus or that root rot, um, what can happen is that eventually that fungus is going to start to eat the, uh, the trunk of the, of the plant. We've actually seen a couple of times when we accidentally give it too much water or letting it stand in water that the plant starts to die and we, to try and save it we actually try, we pull it out to see if we can cut away that root rot. But what has happened if it's gone too far is actually that the fungus has started to eat the trunk under, from underneath. So when you pull this out, there are almost no roots and the entire nice elephant's foot here is almost entirely eaten from the inside out. So there's nothing left. And if, it's, if that has happened, it's gone too far, you cannot save that plant. It will die. But it just shows you how important it is to never ever give this too much water or let it stand in water. Now when it is time to water your Bocania, which is not that often, but when it's time, try to avoid giving water next to the stem or onto the stem. Our experience says that if you do that, if you get water on the stem often, or if it is very, very wet around the stem, what will happen is that the stem will start to rot. And the roots coming out from the side of this nice thick trunk here will let go and not work properly. That is one thing that could have happened to a plant that is doing this that I showed you before, when it's not settled in the pot. It's actually moving a little bit could be one of the reasons for that. So make sure that you try and water around the stem and not on the stem. Another trick can also be to take your plant, place it in a couple of centimeters of water, let it suck up and get that root ball uh, a little bit wet. Then you remove it from that water, let the excess water drain out completely and that is also one way of not giving water on the stem. Now we recommend you to shower your plants every now and again. Now we do not shower our indoor plants to raise the humidity. That doesn't work. If you wanted to do that, you'd have to shower the plant 
perhaps a few times a day for that to help. We want you to shower this plant either with spraying it with some uh, misty water or just taking it into the shower and actually showering it off um, a couple of times a year. The reason for that is that we want you to take away all of the dust that is accumulating on the leaves over a period of time. This can actually hinder the photosynthesis of this plant and makes it grow even slower. So just by showering it a little bit, you get all of that dust away from the leaves. Because it is quite hard to try and use something to get that dust off of every leaf of this plant because it has so many leaves. So by just showering it, it's just an easy way to get that dust off. And you're also avoiding cutting yourself on those sharp leaves as well. Now here's a tip for you. When you do shower your Burkonia, take a plastic bag or a towel or something to cover up the pot so that you don't get a lot of water to the soil here. Just cover it up all the way onto the stem. You could even use the stem and tie the plastic bag around the stem so that you will not get any water to the roots. You just want to have water on the foliage. The Bocconia recovata is one of the few tropical plants that you do not have to prune. Now pruning usually is a good thing. We have a video you can go and watch about pruning and why it's a good thing. But concerning the Bocconia, you don't have to prune it. And one of the reasons is that it's a very, very slow growing plant. You, if you don't have to prune it, don't prune it. But eventually it will get to be larger and it will grow from each of these small stems here will just continue to grow and become larger. And after a while they will drop the oldest leaves here and it will become a stem. So when it becomes to, when it gets to be too large or too high, it might be reaching the ceiling of your house or something. You can prune it if you want to. And it can look something like this. It has been growing and growing and growing and it has been shedding the leaves and it has been creating this nice stem here. But it's become too long. Then you can just cut it off and cut it off anywhere on that stem. When you do that, it will start to give you new shoots from where you've cut that. So if you choose to cut it, way high, it's from there it will start to grow again. So when you actually cut it, make sure to cut it perhaps quite close to the main stem. So when it, when it starts to grow, you get a new, dense, nice Bocconia. The Bocconia is actually quite difficult to propagate. I could try and propagate this cut off stem here uh, and I, it could work but usually it doesn't. It will rot and not give you any roots if you put this in water or in soil. So the most common way of propagating a Bocconia is actually to wait for it to send out babies. What I mean by that is that it will come out new stems from in between the soil and this, this nice base here. And when those small babies come out, you just let them be. You let them grow until they are a little bit larger. And by that I mean they should have a new base, a new stem, that are at least a couple of centimeters thick or an inch thick before you try and separate that baby from the mother. So let it become quite large before you do that operation. Uh, but it is quite a difficult plant to propagate. So moving on to nutrients or fertilizing this plant. You do not have to fertilize this plant quite often. Our recommendation is that you only try and fertilize once a month during its active period. 
And the active period, at least here in the Northern Hemisphere, is from March till October. And then you stop fertilizing it completely over the winter. And when you fertilize, you use just a normal full coverage fertilizer that you can buy almost anywhere. And make sure to follow the instructions on the label, because if you give this plant too much fertilizer, you will get problems. And what will happen is that it will look as if the plant isn't getting enough water. So what you will probably do is that you will start to give it, if not more water, than, but more frequently water. And you can also see that the soil is actually still a little bit wet, but it looks as though it's dry. What has happened is that when you give it too much fertilizer, that fertilizer is actually a form of salt. And if you get a salt buildup in the soil, what that salt does is that it binds and holds a lot of the water so that it doesn't, it is not available for the plant to drink. So the soil is moist, but the plant isn't getting any water. If you see this happening, if it looks like it is dry, but the soil is wet and you know that you've given it water, it could be that you've given it too much fertilizer and, and you, that you have a salt buildup in the soil. What you do then is that you repot. Make sure to get away, get all of those salts away from the roots. You repot it and you will probably be fine. If you never ever give this plant fertilizer, you could get a nutrient deficiency. One way of seeing that on the plant is that all of a sudden, all of the leaves on the plant, all of them simultaneously starts to become shaded in color. They are losing the color of the leaves. It could be either that it is too root bound, that it has a massive root system and it needs to be repotted. And therefore it also cannot get the nutrients it wants. But if it's not root bound, it can still be nutrient deficiency. And you see that on the overall of the plant, it just loses its color and looks a little bit faded. However, and this pushes us to the next thing, and that is pests. Because if you get pests on this, it can also look like that. It can start to get shaded in color. And one of the reasons for that is that m most indoor pests that we get, they actually grab a hold of the leaves and they suck out the nutrients in the plant. And if you get, for instance, spider mites, which could attack this plant, you cannot see them with your naked eye. So what you see is that the plant is starting to get a little bit faded in color. However, the most, freak, the, the, most, um, the most common pest that we get on this is not spider mites. It's actually scale or mealybugs. Now, mealybugs are quite easy to get rid of. You, because you see them, they are, they are white, they're small and fluffy, so you can actually remove them with your hands if you want to. However, removing mealybugs with your hands, you do not get all of the eggs. So you could actually be removing all of them, but later on you find new ones on them. It's because you haven't removed the eggs. Same way with scale. Scale actually bites onto the leaves and then it stays on that leaf. So you, you, you can just see on the leaves that you have small, darker bumps on the leaves. If you have that, it's probably scale. To remove mealybugs and scale, I recommend you to use a pesticide. Go out and buy a pesticide that says on the box that it can handle scale and mealybugs. And you can try and remove it with that because that pesticide will also try and kill the eggs as well. So you're not just removing the adults, you're also removing and killing the eggs. If you get spider mites on this, there is a simple way of removing spider mites. 
you can actually just take it into the shower or out in your garden and just let it just shower it with water when you when that when that shower hits the leaves of the plant you're actually knocking off those small mites so you're getting rid of all of the adults on the leaves however the eggs are still attached so what you need to be doing is that once a day for at least two weeks you have to shower the plant to get rid of those spider mites but it is a more environmental friendly way of getting rid of pests than using a pesticide so if you get spider mites that is one easy way to get rid of them now you could use the showering method for mealybugs as well uh, it can work however you need to be doing it for a longer period of time than two weeks to make sure that all the eggs are hatched and that you are removing those fluffy small animals now another positive thing about this plant other than it's very easy to care for you can place it almost anywhere in your home is that it is not poisonous either to pets or humans uh, however as I said before the leaves are sharp so if you have small children or if you have cats that could see this nice trunk and see that oh something to scratch on you need to know that these sharp leaves could injure someone as it injured me here but uh, in small children it can be a problem and if a small child were to bite on this and pull or if a cat or a dog would do that you can also get cuts in the mouth as well but the plant itself is not poisonous so it's not dangerous for the child or for the pets in that way but it is sharp so make sure that you keep it out of reach for small children and or cats or dogs that are a little bit nosy now if you like this video please give it a thumbs up that really helps our channel a lot if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet please do hit the bell as well so you get a notification every time we put up something new and also like us and follow us on facebook and instagram where you can get sneak previews on upcoming videos and sometimes a little bit more now until next time hi dog